selecting Indiana's next governor. Republicans have maintained the highest office the past 20 years. Should they get another four? When you start doing things like you're an essential business and you're not, that is government gone wild. Key issues include the economy and how to grow it. One of the most important things we can do in this state is support and fertilize entrepreneurship and innovation. But with growth comes controversy. The LEAP project is certainly the best example of what's wrong with government. What should the next governor do to make sure Hoosier students stay ahead of the curve? And we need to work towards getting every child an opportunity to be able to learn so that by third grade they can read. And Hoosier parents have a say. You know, common sense about what books are available to children, what that content of those books are. Now, Indiana's best political team takes your questions straight to the candidates for governor, giving you all the information you need before casting your ballot. From Wish TV, home of Indiana's best political team, this is a special edition of All Indiana Politics, the Indiana Republican Governor's Debate. You are looking live inside the theater at the historic Madam Walker Legacy Center in downtown Indianapolis for a pivotal night in the race for governor of Indiana. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm April Simpson. And I'm Phil Sanchez. Tonight, Wish TV is proud to host this debate in the Republican primary for Indiana governor. Over the next 90 minutes, we're going to talk about a lot of topics. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, the five candidates who met our requirements for this debate are on stage with us right now. They are Curtis Hill, who served four years as Indiana's Attorney General. Brad Chambers, who served two years as Secretary of Commerce with Governor Holcomb. Suzanne Crouch, Indiana's current Lieutenant Governor for the past eight years. Eric Doden, a businessman who led the Indiana Economic Development Corporation for then Governor Mike Pence. And Mike Braun, who is currently a United States Senator and businessman from Southern Indiana. Before we get to the first question, we want to make sure you know the rules for tonight. News 8 government and politics reporter Garrett Berquist has those for us. We'll ask a question to the candidates and each one will have 60 seconds to answer it. Then if necessary or if a candidate requests, we may offer 30 seconds of rebuttal time on the same question. We are also saving time at the end of the debate so that each candidate will have up to 90 seconds for a closing statement, but per our agreement, we will not have opening statements. We should also tell you the candidates have not been provided the questions or the topics for tonight and that podium placement and speaking order was determined by a drawing with candidate representatives last week. Phil and April. Garrett, thank you very much. Let's get to our first question tonight. Several top Indiana Republicans, including some leaders in the General Assembly, have suggested that it's time to completely eliminate Indiana's income tax. I want to ask for a show of hands right now. If you believe Indiana should fully eliminate the state income tax, please raise your hand now. Okay. We'll start with you, Mr. Hill. Why did you not raise your hand, sir? Well, it's a great question. <clears throat> There's nobody in this room that wants to pay taxes, but the reality is that we have services that we are, are necessary that provide revenue, and to eliminate the, the income tax is really addressing $8 billion of, of revenue. Um, it's, uh, we need to address uh, a total tax policy. We need to uh, evaluate what it is that we want government to do determine a fair way and a fair system to, to provide revenue, and that revenue stream is property tax, income tax, and sales tax, but making sure that the rates are low and fair across the board. Um, in this particular instance, uh, uh, my opponent, Suzanne Crouch, has, has suggested that we ax the tax. Uh, that's impractical to have a decision to ax the tax or rid, rid ourselves from the tax liability at this point, unless there's some type of a plan. If there's a plan, then do it now, your lieutenant governor, at this point. Okay, Mr. Hill, thank you. Mr. Chambers, 60 seconds to you. Sure, thank you. Listen, I, I, low taxes are, are what we should should strive for and in, in, uh, in focus on, but 
but I believe Indiana is competitive on a national basis. As Secretary of Commerce, I was very involved in, in, in analyzing our competitive set uh, nationally. N we're number nine in the country. And, and when you look at taxation, you can't just look at one tax. You've got to look at the whole array of taxes. And we are number nine in the country. We are very competitive. And what we don't want to do is take resources to take away education, uh, from fixing education, supporting our, our police officers, addressing the mental health crisis and the child care crisis, uh, and dealing with health care in the health care costs statewide. And so um, I believe it, it, it needs to, to, you need to look at all taxes. I believe that the best way is to grow our economy, grow our economy, put more money in people's pockets, um, and that way we can fix education with a growing economy, and government can actually be smaller, and taxes can then go down. You cannot cut your way to success here. You've got to do it incrementally and over time and with a plan. Okay, Mr. Chambers, thank you very much. Your, your time is up. Uh, Ms. Crouch, you've been very outspoken about this on the campaign trail. You're the only person that raised your hand. Why do you believe that? You know, I'm the only one on this stage who has the political courage to suggest that we eliminate the state income tax. And we're going to ax the tax. I travel the state, and Hoosiers are struggling with the high cost of living, inflation, and Bidenomics. We have an opportunity to put thousands of dollars back into your pockets every single year. Now, my opponents say we can't do it. But what they're really saying is government needs more of your money and you need less. It's not going to happen overnight. It has to be phased in. We have to have triggers in place to protect against economic downturns. But as former Vice Chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, as former Auditor of State, we can absolutely do it. We have to limit government growth. We have to end wasteful government spending. And then we have to find efficiencies in government. When we do, we put money in your pockets. We grow small businesses here in Indiana. And we make Indiana no income tax state, drawing people to our state. Ms. Crouch, thank you very much. Mr. Doden, 60 seconds. Well, I, I believe that governors should not be making promises they can't keep. Uh, so this is going to be a partnership with the General Assembly. They're actually studying this right now. They're looking at how we can uh, change our taxes, maybe uh, over time, reduce income taxes in a fiscally responsible way. Uh, so I think uh, that's going to be important to work with them on that. But I think the most important tax that I hear out there is our property taxes for seniors. You know, we've had property taxes go up 15 percent this year in some cases, some cases more. And our seniors on fixed income are telling me that there's a possibility that they could lose their home. And I think that's just wrong. And so I think we need to work with the General Assembly to make sure we have a, a property a cap on their taxes so that they can plan when they're on a fixed income. It should be surety for them. And then, then I think you have to work with the General Assembly to make sure that you have an appropriate, fiscally responsible uh, method of lowering taxes going forward. Okay. Mr. Doden, thank you. Mr. Braun, you didn't raise your hand. We just heard a moment ago from the individual that proposed it that it would be gradual. So axing the tax was kind of sensational, I think, to grab attention. Everyone on this stage is going to be for lowering income taxes, but how are you going to do it? The only way you're going to do it is who on the stage is going to tackle each agency that we have and make sure that if they're being run bureaucratically and too expensively, that is how you finance that. So if you want to do it, that was a headline. Who do you think is going to have the best ability to actually lower it by getting in, getting your hands dirty, going into all 30 agencies, give or take, and with the experience where you've done it before in your own career? I did that over 37 years building a business, and I'll know how to do it. And Eric is right. Property taxes would be what we hear most about and why didn't we do something to keep the lid on them when they were killing people over the last couple years with too much. Mr. Braun, your time is up. Thank you very much. Ms. Crouch, 30 seconds. Do you want a rebuttal? Yes, of course. You know, our, my opponents say we can't do it, but that money is yours. It's not theirs. And you will always spend it more wisely than the government. And in addition to that, other states are already doing this. Iowa is doing it. Kentucky is doing it. We don't want to be left behind. We want to be competitive. And the National Federation of Independent Businesses said the number one tax that will help small businesses that we can eliminate is the income tax. We can attract people to Indiana. We put money into your pockets. We make Indiana a no-income tax state. Okay, Ms. Crouch, thank you. You raised your hand, Mr. Hill. I did. I, I think that when we're talking about taxation, the number one relief that we can give on taxation at this point is the Mike Braun gas tax. Uh, we have a gas tax that goes up a penny each year. Uh, we can put 16 cents a gallon at the pump. 
uh, for every Hoosier by repealing back to the gas tax from uh, pre-2018 levels. Okay, Mr. Hill. Mr. Doden, you raised your hand, and I'll get to you in a second, Mr. Braun. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify this. If, if you ask the income tax right now, it's a 40% hole in the budget. It's $8 billion. And so either you have to show how you're going to lower expenses by $8 billion or how you're going to replace the tax. And until you show how you're going to lower expenses or replace the tax, then from my perspective, ax the tax is just a gimmick. Okay. Mr. Braun, your, your name was invoked. Go yes. ahead. So back then, in uh, 2017, we are the crossroads of America. If our infrastructure is not in good shape, we're not going to get businesses here. And by the way, Governor Holcomb signed that bill, as well as most Republicans voting for it. Most Democrats would have voted for it, other than it was an idea. If you're going to pay for roads and bridges, we, and you're spending all that money on infrastructure, that's smart. We also moved the sales tax on fuel, all for roads and bridges. That was a good investment in our economy. Up. Mr. Braun, thank you. Mr. Chambers, go ahead, 30 seconds, I mean, sir. Senator Braun touched 45 tax, tax increases during his term in the state legislature, in addition to the gas tax that, that Curtis uh, suggested. But as it relates to the, uh, the income tax, I looked at this, I looked at the states that have no income tax, like Tennessee and Florida, and what we found was the property tax is higher, much higher, like double than, than, uh, in, than it would be in Indiana. And so back to my original point, it's the whole array of taxation. You can't just move one tax and, and double property taxes. And, and as I've gone around the state of Indiana, property taxes is the number one issue I've heard from everybody. And we have to address it, and I will address it as governor. 30 seconds is up. Thank you very much. Candidates, thank you. April? Let's turn now to crime and public safety. Over the past several years, Indiana communities have seen a surge in violent crime and crimes involving guns. Now one Indiana County Sheriff in Washington County is ending overnight patrols due to a lack of staffing. What would you as governor to help do to help cities and counties fight crime? And should the state play a bigger role in prosecuting criminals? Mr. Chambers, we're going to start with you. Yes, thank you. It, it, uh, crime is a, a, a challenge and we issued um, in this campaign, we've been, we've been issuing five policies, and one of them is our protect and serve public safety policy. We have got to make sure we have uniform bail for, for uh, repeat and violent offenders. We've, we've got to make sure the officers in, in our law enforcement, in our, in our, uh, uh, in our first responders have uh, resources, especially for mental health as well. Our, our police officers are now mental health professionals, right? And so is our firefighters. And so our protect and per serve plan outlines our fentanyl plan re regarding um, bail, consistent bail application for repeat and violent offenders uh, and dealing with mental health and behavior health in, in our society. And so um, we're, we're very aggressive on that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Ms. Crouch. Yes, as governor, I'll make sure that our state police are fully staffed because we're understaffed right now to be able to provide assistance to local and law enforcement. But then in addition to that, I will end the revolving door on the criminal justice system. And what we have to understand is much of the crime and many of the other drugs that are coming here are coming in through our southern borders. And so as governor, I'll make sure we stand our National Guard to the border to help fight the crime and the fentanyl that is coming in here, but also work to protect our boundaries here in Indiana to make sure that illegals that come here will be deported to sanctuary cities. And in 2011, as a state representative, I voted to prohibit sanctuary cities in Indiana. Thank you, Ms. Crouch. Mr. Doden, what would you do to fight crime? Well, I think this is one of the biggest issues in this campaign. And I think you got to go back to 2020 before we can talk about what we're going to do. And I think this is where it's hard to trust Mike Braun in this issue. When he, uh, in the moment of crisis, said that let's get rid of qualified immunity, let's make it easier to sue police. And if you talk to the police, they'll tell you that this made it very difficult on them to do their job. And then he went even further and said, uh, I support uh, Black Lives Matter and I'd probably march with them. So now let's talk about what we can do about it. Um, I've said to our police that we will definitely enforce the rule of law. The rule of law is foundational to this country. We're also going to make sure that the police have the tools and resources and training they need to be successful. And that includes, as governor, we're going to have to go up and help them out and help them recruit more people to come into the system. Right now, they're having sometimes only four or five people when they need to have 20 or 30 people applying for the job. And then beyond that, I think it's just a commitment to keep people safe and make sure that we have a police force that is helping keep people safe. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Doden. Mr. Braun, we, of course, um, 
We'll let you respond to Mr. Doden. But first, how, what would you do to fight crime as governor? So there's only one individual on this stage that's been endorsed by any police agency. Happens to be the Indiana State Troopers. I got that endorsement, along with the endorsement from the uh, National Troopers Coalition. That should tell you what really makes sense. We've got to have prosecutors do their job, including in our own state capital. If you're not prosecuting and putting people in jail that break the law, you're not going to have any job that's going to be doable by our law enforcement. Uh, pay and benefits. That needs to be, finally, we got that where it's supposed to be through our peer group comparison on state police. All law enforcement across the board need to have good pay and benefits. Last night we were asked on another forum who would deport illegal aliens. There was only one on the stage that said they would. That was me. The others did not. Would you like to respond to Mr. Would. Braun, so, Mr. Doden? When it comes to that, that clearly is something, if you're willing to lie and distort, you can say whatever you want. I would never be for the umbrella organizations of BLM, which he's referring to, I think, if he got his facts right. My statement was clear. Anyone can peacefully express their First Amendment rights as long as they do it that way. Any, all lives matter, that was what was meant. And qualified immunity, that is something that obviously is a false too because I'm getting endorsed by the one place that is, would be impacted by it. Thank you, Mr. Braun. Mr. Hill. Well, the one thing that I wouldn't do is stand by and watch the city of Indianapolis burn at the hands of lawless looters and hoodlums uh, like the Holcomb Crouch administration during 2020. Uh, I also wouldn't make it easier to sue police officers, uh, which was the proposed federal legislation that my friend Mike Braun uh, put forward as a United States Senator. I'm the only one on this stage who's actually fought crime. I'm a career prosecutor. I have locked people up uh, for violent offenses, and what I know is that the vast amount of crime in any particular community is committed by a very small percentage of people. If you determine who those people are and you have an effective strategy, crime goes down, public safety goes up. I will uh, endorse uh, the, the police, support the police. Uh, I've done that. I've, I've put together uh, uh, crime programs, and we can do that at the state level as well. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Doden, would you like to respond? Yeah, you know, um, you know it's kind of convenient uh, to do revisionist history when you're, in your own words, said that you would support Black Lives Matter and would probably do march with them. But beyond that, he, he's not endorsed by the Indiana State Troopers. It's the Indiana State Alliance. Uh, and he also, in his own press release, said that qualified immunity, which is what's used to protect police, is misguided protection. That is the words that he used in his own press release, misguided protection. Thank you. Ms. Crouch, you have 30 seconds. Yes, uh, my opponents have very selective hearing because last night I did say that I would deport illegals from the state of Indiana and actually in 2011 as a state representative voted to prohibit sanctuary cities in Indiana. And as, as the governor candidate, I've received the endorsement of 150 local elected officials all over Indiana, including two dozen sheriffs. And so I know that I will be the kind of governor that will support law enforcement and that I know that they will be the type of people that will work and to help keep Hoosier safe in our communities. Thank you, Ms. Crouch. Mr. Chambers, 30 seconds. Uh, Senator Braun used the word lie and distort. I think that's applicable to his, his, uh, uh, his role on the border. He's, he's been a, a senator since 2018, and there's 7 million people who have come in on his watch. Two years of that watch was, was uh, with, with uh, President Trump. So he's done literally nothing to stop the flow of illegal aliens over our border. The front door of our country is closed, and the back door is wide open, and he has not led on one initiative uh, to, to, to address that. But he's been, at the, he's been down to the border six times. Thank you. We need to move on to our next question. Phil? That's right. This next question is on illegal immigration. It's a dominant topic, of course, in politics today. It's been one of the, the number one things we've heard on our Facebook page and emails that we got about this debate. Indiana, obviously not on uh, the border, right, but feels the effects of it. So what do you believe, and we'll start with you, Ms. Crouch, what do you believe the state should do about illegal immigration? 
Well, due to Biden's failed illegal immigration policies, every state is a border state, and that includes Indiana. And so as governor, I will be sure that we have National Guard troops to our southern borders to be, help protect them. But then also looking at protecting Indiana's borders. And if we see an influx of illegal immigrants, we will deport them to sanctuary cities because what they are bringing is deadly fentanyl into our communities that are destroying our neighborhoods and killing our young people. And so also, it's not just the fentanyl and the drugs in the border, it's about countries in China buying our farmland and buying land near our military sites. And when I saw that China could buy land here in Indiana, our farmland, I helped to stop it. And then, when they could buy land near our military sites, I stopped that. That is what we need to do to protect Indiana. Okay. Ms. Crouch, thank you. Mr. Doden, 60 seconds to you, sir. Well, for, first of all, President Biden needs to do his job and Congress needs to do their job. And that includes Senator Mike Braun, who went to the border recently, did a television commercial, said that I'm gonna provide solutions and providing solutions, then comes back a few days later and says, well, let's not provide solutions because of politics. That's not leadership. Here's what we're going to do. We're gonna send the National Guard to the border and partner with governors. If the federal government won't solve it, we're gonna partner with our governors to solve it. We're gonna to try to do the best we can to make sure cartels cannot bring drugs across the border. At the same time, we're going to work with our local law enforcement, give them tools, training, give them the people and the things that they need to make sure that we can protect our people here, take care of the cartels here, have stricter sentences for drug dealers, and, and then finally, we need to get more resources to the people that are suffering from addiction and make sure that we restore them to their families and community. Mr. Doden, thank you. Mr. Braun, what do you think the state of Indiana should do about illegal immigration? Clearly, so, clearly some of my opponents ought to at least get uh, Government 101 down. Uh, this is due to Biden and the Democratic Senate that had zero interest in doing anything out there. Donald Trump had immigration at lowest levels ever and it's the same legislative template that Biden has undone all of that with. So you can say whatever you want, and when you get barrages like this that are based on nothing, it's because everyone up here is not putting a plan out there that Hoosiers trust. That is when you're losing, just like when I ran against two congressmen and a sitting senator six years ago, they tried that. Be careful when you listen, when people throw retreads and things that don't make sense, based on lies and distortions. There's plenty of material to work with, everyone here, if they want to do that. But when it comes to the border, if you're governor, you can take your cue from what Governor DeSantis did and what we did in Texas. That's what needs to be done. Mr. Brown, we're gonna move on. Thank you very much. Mr. Hill, 60, 60 seconds to you, sir. Well, my concern here is that we sent, we sent Senator Braun to Washington at his request to fight for us in Washington, D.C. And part of that fight was on the border. Well, I don't want to hear blame, with, it's the Democrats, we couldn't get that done. Uh, you were there to fight for us. And halfway through the term, I'm going to give up, I don't want to do it anymore. Immigration and border issues are a federal issue. And the reality is, the federal government has dropped the ball, including our United States Senator and our own Senator here in, on this stage. Moving forward, we make sure that the, the National Guard, Indiana National Guard goes forward on the border. I call for that. Governor Holcomb finally relented and sent them in. We need to continue that process. But here at home, we need to make sure that there's no safe landing for illegal aliens. No places to work, no places for, for services. That's harsh, but we're either gonna fix this problem or we're not. I choose to fix it. Mr. Braun, I'll get to you in a moment on this. Um, I want to get your, your thoughts on this, uh, Mr. Chambers. What would you do about illegal immigration in the yeah, state? Yeah, it shouldn't be a state problem. It, heretofore, it has not been a state problem. It is a state problem now. I'm all over the state meeting with, with, uh, with Hoosiers. And, it, and the first question often that comes up is about the border. And it is now, because of federal, federal failure, congressional failure, it is a, a state issue. Fentanyl pouring across the border is killing, Amer uh, killing Hoosiers. And so in our Protect and Serve plan, we have a, a fentanyl task force to address that issue. I would absolutely send uh, troops to the border to help uh, Governor Abbott address this issue because our feds are not doing that. Um, the other area it's affecting is workforce. We have illegal uh, immigrants coming into the, into the state of Indiana and taking work from, from some of our unions and some of our other uh, employers. And so we have to deal with the, the uh, and taking jobs away from Hoosiers. And, the, and so, so this federal failure 
the failure of Congress to deal with this issue is really a, a, a state issue. It's costing us Hoosier dollars to deal with this. Uh, not, not to mention the increased crime. Okay. And, and that is in our Protect and Serve plan as well. Okay, Mr. Chambers, thank you. Mr. Braun, you were mentioned specifically. I'll give you 30 seconds to respond. So you're mighty uh, mice up here when you can say stuff and you've never been in the position of doing it. If you want to figure out who's going to take action on stuff like this, it was your junior senator that got the vaccine mandate stopped that was unconstitutional. I dusted off an old act that nobody thought of. I did that. I generated the first veto that Biden had to exercise on ESG. I know how to get things done. I've been on the firing line. It's easy when you've done nothing and you say you want to do it. All right, Mr. Braun, thank you very much. Candidates, thank you. April has the next question. Go ahead. We have received hundreds of viewer questions for tonight. So I want to ask this one from Darshana. If elected, how will you protect religious freedoms for all Hoosiers, not just Christians? I'm going to start with you, Mr. Doden. Well, I mean, I'm a big believer in religious freedom. Uh, my grandpa was a pastor, and uh, we, we definitely believe that everyone has the right to worship in the way that they see fit. Uh, so we're going to make sure that, that we protect religious freedom for people. Uh, we're going to make sure that we treat people the way that we want to be treated. Uh, these are just, to me, foundational basic uh, issues uh, that we're going to make sure that we help people feel that they have the right to practice their religion the way they see, they see fit. Thank you. Mr. Braun. I'm glad that he believes that. Uh, the question would be, would he ever put his, uh, money where his money where his mouth is? I was in the legislature when we confronted that issue back uh, several years ago on record supporting it. I would hope everyone on this stage would be unequivocally in support of religious freedom, just like you should be of First and Second Amendment rights as well. And there are a couple on the stage here that had to think about it, whether they were going to support and be aggressive for our Second Amendment rights. Came on to that issue late. And a lot of it, you got to decipher through. I went through this rodeo six years ago. You hear a lot of stuff. You got to sift through what makes sense and what doesn't. And for any of us here, you ought to be looking at a record that makes sense, not what you say you're going to do. That's very easy to do. All right, thank you, Mr. Braun. Mr. Hill, how would you protect religious freedoms? Uh, the same way I have been protecting religious freedoms as Attorney General. Uh, that was my number one job, protecting freedom. Uh, religious freedom is, is absolutely important. Basic freedom, sometimes we talk about uh, getting religious freedom. Our basic freedoms in this country are under, uh, under assault. Uh, so we need to make sure that we do that as well. Uh, but one of the ways that we protect freedom is to make sure that we don't support or give aid and comfort to Marxist organizations like Black Lives Matter uh, that are anti-Semitic, that are racist, uh, that are anti-family. Uh, that's the basis of who we are. And we cannot uh, issue support for organizations that are anti-freedom and anti-religion. Thank you. Mr. Chambers, same question. Yeah. Of course, we have to pr protect religious freedoms, but you know, right in this moment, we have to talk about anti-Semitism as well, and, and that's been winding its way through uh, the, the legislature, and, and that is a very important issue with the act of terrorism that happened on October 7th. I mean, we need to stand up and protect uh, our Jewish friends in, in this state and, and be bold and, and aggressive with that. And so that's part of uh, protecting all of religious freedoms, especially uh, right now and in time of crisis, our, our Jewish friends. On, on, on Senator's comment about track record, I mean, he uses that comment all the time. I mean, he's got a track record on BLM. He's got a track record on his position on qualified immunity that is impacting the ability for police officers to fill their roles statewide. He's got 45 tax increases. That's on his track record. Um, you know, let's talk, and you have no action on the border. That's your track record. Thank you. Ms. Crouch, we have six seconds. How would you as governor protect religious freedoms here in Indiana? Well, as Hoosiers and as Americans, we should have the right to live our lives without interference from government, and that includes religious freedom. Our country was founded because people wanted to have religious freedom. And so as governor, I'll fight for your religious freedom, but also fight for your economic freedom and your ability to live your life without interference from government. Because at the end of the day, that is what people want. 
is to be able to live their lives without interference from government. Religious freedom is a basic, basic part of that. Thank you. So, Mr. Doden, you have 30 oh, I just seconds. want to clarify one thing. So there was this, uh, we came late to the Second Amendment uh, accusation. And uh, the reality is I've been a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. Senator Braun knows I've been a strong supporter of that. Uh, we did get the uh, questionnaire a little late uh, because uh, the uh, NRA got it to us late. So we filled out the questionnaire within one day, got it back, and we have an AQ rating, which is an A rating uh, with questionnaire. Uh, and so I just, just to be clear, there was no uh, equivocating. It was just we are clearly pro Second Amendment. Mr. Brown, you have 30 seconds. Would you like to respond? Well, it was always clear where I was, and that record is clear. Uh, I've got a perfect rating with the NRA. A lot of times when you got to get to the issue, it's because you weren't out front with it. There's a big difference. I've tried to take the five years I've spent representing Hoosiers there and be a loud voice for all the things we believe in. And my track record is clear. Faith, family, community. I got a freedom and opportunity agenda out there that you ought to take a look at. No one's got that. That's your time. Thank you. Candidates, thank you very much. More questions for the candidates coming up after the break. We will be right back in moments. You're watching the debate in the Republican primary for Indiana governor live from the Madam Walker Legacy Center in downtown Indianapolis on a very busy Wednesday night. We will be right back. Wish TV's GOP Governor's Debate is brought to you in part by Indianapolis Urban League and African American Coalition of Indianapolis. Wish TV's GOP Governor's Debate is brought to you in part by Gaylor Electric. And welcome back live from the Madam Walker Legacy Center on this Wednesday night. You're watching the debate in the Republican primary for Indiana Governor. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let's begin this segment with education. A new Indiana law passed this spring requires school districts to hold back third grade students who do not pass the I read test. I want to ask you to raise your hand if you agree with that new law. Mr. Braun, how would you explain your decision to the parent of a third grader? So when it comes to education, uh, number one, that's half our budget, K through 12. Whoever's been there and has not gotten anything done should take some responsibility for it. If we can't get our kids reading at levels that uh, are better than what they were 10 years ago, something's got to give. And the solution to it, and what I want to see more of, is more choice, more competition, and something completely different. When you do these kind of knee-jerk reactions, even with what you're talking about in terms of trying to make a cure of it, you've got to comprehensively go through the system. We have gotten to be, if we're going to be the crossroads of America, workforce is the number thing I hear about when I travel and visit all 92 counties. It's got to be a comprehensive approach. And it's got to start with teaching kids basic skill sets by the time they get in there to where they leave as a high school graduate with something more than what we're currently giving it. Thank you. That's your time. Mr. Hill, you did not raise your hand. How would you explain your decision to the parent of a third grader? Well, my wife's a teacher. She's a high school English teacher. And the number of times that we've sat at the kitchen table and I've watched her agonizingly frustrated over uh, the kids and their development. Uh, they don't capitalize, they don't punctuate. So what they're learning in the process is failing. Um, we need to address that. But we need to address it per individual child. We don't need to blanket everyone together and lump them all together and say one size fits all. We need to provide individual assessments to make sure that we're doing the right thing by these children. Uh, we need to give them more, uh, more opportunities to learn at that third grade level. Uh, we need to really revamp our entire education system. Uh, we need to get rid of the federal entanglements. We need to, to shrink the size of the Indiana Department of Education. Uh, we need to make sure that we go back to basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also include civics so that we can teach children uh, what it means to be patriotic and a, and a good citizen. Um, we need to have classical education moving forward. Uh, these are the ways that we improve our scores for our children and their educational process. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Mr. Chambers, you are the only one on the stage. You raised your hand. 
There, there is no greater challenge and no greater opportunity than our educational system right now. It is very backwards looking uh, and it needs to be pointed forward. It needs to be modernized. It's unacceptable that third graders in Indiana cannot read uh, as they move move forward. That's a literacy challenge that will that will follow that child forever and impact our future economic growth as well. A child who cannot read in third grade going into fourth grade has four times more likely to drop out of high school. Our sixth graders are struggling, 35% of them are struggling getting through the sixth grade uh, math exam, the I Learn math exam. Parents need to be right in the middle of this conversation. We need to provide, uh, we need to provide choice, but we also need to individualize education, and we need to get more money into teachers and teachers' incentives and less out of buildings and administrative costs. There's no greater opportunity for the future of our state than fixing these education and modernizing it going forward. Thank you. Ms. Crouch, you actually did raise your hand. If children cannot read by the third grade, they're going to struggle through life and they're going to struggle through school. And so we need to ensure that they can read by the third grade and be successful. It's why as governor, I'll make sure the parents have more choices in their children's education. We'll make sure that they have control over what's being taught to our children. As governor, our education system will be focused on the four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and reasoning. We will teach our children how to think, not what to think. And then I will reform education, take the five agencies that deal with education and workforce training and get them down to one, where now everyone will be on the same software system, on the same page, working in tandem to prepare every child for that next step in life, whether it's enlistment, employment, enrollment or apprenticeship. And then, as governor, we will put more money back into the classroom so that those children will be able to read by third grade. Thank you, Ms. Crouch. Mr. Doden, you did not raise your hand. How do you explain that to a parent? Well, because we have a plan. Uh, and so you can go and see our plans in writing at dodenforindiana.com, but we have a plan. I want to explain the plan. Uh, we, first of all, have a constitutional obligation to educate our children. It's enshrined in our Constitution, and I believe we have a moral obligation. That's why I believe in parents having choice. Uh, that's why I believe in vouchers. That's why I believe that uh, we need to have competition, but we have a further plan. Uh, we have a teacher investment program because we have a teacher crisis in our small communities that would attract and retain talented teachers. We're proposing that teachers be income tax and property tax free. It's about a $5,000 pay raise for a teacher. And we're doing this directly to the teacher so that administration and the unions do not get their cut. But beyond that, there's a billion dollars coming free in our budget because of good fiscal management that we're putting a stake in the ground and saying that we need to use for universal early childhood education. And so we are, have a plan for early childhood education to make sure that our kids are well educated. Thank you, Mr. Doe. I'm gonna move on to our next question, Bill. Yeah, we'll stick here with education for a moment. You know, we recently had an exclusive interview here on Wish TV with Jamie Dimon, the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. He had very interesting comments about education, and I want to play those for you right now. Look. Too much focus in education has been on, you know, uh, graduating college or graduating this, but it should be on jobs. I think schools should be measuring, did the kids get out and get a good job? So you could be a teller and make $40,000 a year as a 17-year-old. And if, you're, you know, if you happen to have a family at 18 or whatever, you, know, you get $20,000 in medical benefits for your family. And so you could be a welder, you could be a coder, you could be cyber, you could be automotive, you could be all those, those jobs are 40 to 60, $70,000 a year. So jobs, 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 education. I know there are a lot of efforts taking place in Indianapolis and around the country, but I think we've fallen behind as a nation. And we, we covered similar comments just last year from CEO, Lilly CEO, David Ricks, who said education attainment in Indiana is not good. So we'll go to this next question. We'll start with you, Mr. Hill. Is Indiana doing enough to prepare high school students for jobs after graduating? 60 seconds to you, sir. Uh, the short answer is no, and we need to do more. Uh, there are so many opportunities, as the, as the speaker said, there are so many opportunities out there for kids for youngsters uh, to grow into vocations and we need to train them at a better stage. We need to identify their talents at an earlier age and make sure that we direct them into those paths. Uh, this idea that everyone goes to college uh, is, uh, it, it's really, uh, really sad because what happens is we have too many kids going to college getting a worthless degree gender studies uh, coming up with two hundred thousand dollars in debt and trying to figure out how they're going to make world uh, uh, make it on the uh, down their future uh, these kids need to have programs that are lined up for their talents 
and I would support vocational programs, uh, also encourage military uh, programs for children. Okay, Mr. Hill, thank you. Mr. Chambers, 60 seconds. Are we doing enough for, for high school students? I would adjust uh, Mr. Diamond's comment to wages. When I was Secretary of Commerce, I laser focused on raising wages in Indiana. Indiana wages are 30% less than, than U.S. average, and that is unacceptable to me because Indiana is not but a below average state. So let's talk about wages. I was, I was thrilled to be able to, to move that by bringing in high wage jobs in Indiana. We can do it. But, but trades is, is important in, in, in our learn to earn policy that we put out in January. We have a focus on trades. It doesn't always have to be college. In, in one of the trades for, for construction, for, for electrical, for plumbing, the other trade I like is for a civics trade, for police and firefighters. When I was growing up, we looked up to people in uniforms. Those are good living for people. So a life sciences trade. So correct, let's, let's make sure we're preparing people to l earn more, right? It's about wages and jobs. And, and you can do that starting in seventh grade. One of those trade pathways is college. Okay, Mr. Chambers, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crouch, 60 seconds. Our education system should be preparing our children for the jobs of the future. And those are advanced manufacturing, ag bioscience, cybersecurity, defense, healthcare orthopedics, and life sciences. And so we need to be preparing children that can enter into those professions. But we also need to be preparing children that can support the infrastructure that has to be in place for these professions. And it's why I want to reform, as governor, our education system and our workforce training system, because we have five agencies that deal with workforce training and education. Let's get them down to one, everyone on the same page, everyone on the same software system, preparing our children for the next step in college, the next step upon graduation, whether it's enlistment, employment, enrollment, or apprenticeship. Ms. Crouch, thank you. Mr. Doden, 60 seconds. Is Indiana doing enough to prepare high school students? Well, I think uh, this is where some creativity and partnerships have to come in. We actually have an idea that would give seniors more time to do internships and partnerships. We've also been encouraging businesses to go into the high schools and make them aware of some of the creative things they're doing right around them. Uh, sometimes when you ask the high school students that they know what's going on just down the street, they don't even know about the business or the opportunity. And then we have this uh, Jim Kelly School of Business in Fort Wayne uh, that is allowing people to use AI to see if they want to do various things like, you know, right there they can try to weld, they can try to, you know, do heavy equipment right there in that room and then see if that's a job that they would like. Uh, but I think this is the kind of partnerships that we need. And then we've tried to also get with parents. One time I was in a room with 300 parents and they all said, hey, we need more you know, more kids in the trade, and I ask how many of you have encouraged your kids to go in the trade and nobody raised their hand. So I think that it's also a partnership with parents helping them understand all the opportunities as well. Okay, Mr. Doden, thank you very much. Mr. Brock? Basically, I said that as an answer of what we needed to do comprehensively to the question before. What Jamie Dimon just said, I've been preaching all along, only about one third of our uh, jobs out there that we guide through our guidance system and the Department of Education pushes needs a four-year degree. For any of us that have run businesses, you clearly need better skill sets coming out of high school. You could take engine mechanics, a wood shop, metal shop. Uh, we need a civics course. You need to be able to balance your checkbook. We're not doing that. And the reason is higher ed has stigmatized those pathways. Our guidance counselors won't mention them. And until you're ready to shake that up, you can do a lot of talking about it, but you're not going to get anything done. We need the perfect balance. Most of that's going to be in real skills that everyone benefits from, high demand, high wage jobs. Parents need to see that so they know where they're going to spend the money for their kids. Ms. Braun, thank you. Candidates, thank you very much. April. Diversity, equity, and inclusion programs received a great deal of attention after the death of George Floyd in 2020. More recently, the programs have faced growing criticism with major companies pulling back. What should Indiana's role be in DEI programs, and what would you keep the state, would you keep the state the DEI officer? I'm going to start with you, Mr. Chambers. Um, 
As it relates to keeping the DEI office open, I don't believe that's uh, something that should be part of a, a government entity. So the answer is no. I don't. I don't. I don't believe that the case. This is about in our business. I've been in business 40 years. This is about creating a, a level playing field for all people to apply, and then hiring the best. We need to drive profitability in our company, uh, and, and to do that, you need to hire the best. So it's about a level playing field, welcoming all, but hiring the best to drive profit and growth in any organization. I don't believe it belongs in a government entity. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Ms. Crouch. DEI is divisive, it's exclusionary, and it is absolutely not inclusive. And so the Supreme Court last year said the racial preferences were unconstitutional for university admissions. And so the reasoning would be that DEI is unconstitutional also. No state dollars should be dedicated to this. But if we're really going to talk about diversity, Let's talk about how we can hire more individuals with disabilities. In September, as the chair of the Intellectual and Developmental Disability Task Force, I visited companies here in Indiana who had the program to hire those Hoosiers with disabilities because they have a 70% unemployment rate and we have 100,000 jobs that are unfilled. So let's give opportunities to those Hoosiers who have disabilities. Not only will they fill jobs, but they will lift up the workforce and add meaning to the workplace. Thank you, Ms. Crouch. Mr. Doden, what should Indiana's role be in DEI programs? Under my leadership as governor, we will not have the office of DEI. Uh, I do not believe in virtue signaling. Uh, I've been taught since I was a kid that those who talk the most often do the least. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build teams and, and we're gonna solve problems. And when you build teams and solve problems, you cannot have groupthink. You have to have people from all different kinds of backgrounds, thought processes, ideas, but you have to have the best people at the table. And we're going to try to build the best team possible with our 30 agency heads. In fact, I'm the only candidate on stage that says every agency head will have to reapply for their job. And then once we begin to solve problems, uh, what you have to do is lead by example, and we're going to lead by example. Thank you, Mr. Doe. Mr. Braun, you have 60 seconds. This is a no-brainer. Freedom and opportunity. You do not need anything else that forces outcomes. My freedom and opportunity agenda clearly says how we're going to do that in about 12 different arenas. And if we do that and give a level playing field for everyone, you get rid of that need. That's mostly crafted in the halls of big government and big business. And if you're not an outspoken critic against that, you're going to end up getting policies like that that we've even embraced in a place like Indiana. So it begged the question, how did we get there? One of the reasons I think that you've got to be more attentive to what goes on in your own state is because that creeps in. If you start listening to only the biggest players, you're going to sometimes do things that are counterproductive. That's how we got there. You're going to have to have somebody that's willing to turn it around and have a plan that benefits everyone. Thank you, Mr. Braun. Mr. Hill, what should Indiana's role be in DEI programs? Well, I'm glad that all my opponents have jumped on the bandwagon because months ago I came out with a proposal that on my first day in office we would eliminate the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and we maintain that. Uh, it's interesting to me that the lieutenant governor is suggesting that it, uh, uh, DEI is, is divisive, but it's her administration uh, that has put this position in place. Um, Mr. Chambers also is uh, critical of DEI, but his company has ESG, which is corporate DEI, all over its website. Uh, we need to get away from this check the box mentality that suggests that we've done something about race when in actuality we've put up walls. Uh, diversity is a wonderful thing, provided that you don't get in the way of excellence. Inclusion is a fantastic thing, provided that you don't uh, give away to competence and equity is a wonderful thing as long as you don't give up fair play. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Ms. Crouch, you were referenced. You have 30 seconds to respond. No. Yeah. Mr. Chambers, would you like to respond? Uh, listen, I mean, Curtis hasn't signed the front of a paycheck for 40 years like I have, you know, and, you know, we hire the best. Um, we, we have a level playing field, we hire the best, we drive for profit, and, and that's been proven out for 40 years because we've grown that business, and, and that's, what, that's how I'd run the state. I think the state needs a CEO. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Going to move on to the next question, Phil. A key component of many Republican campaigns over the past eight years has been being an outsider. 
In fact, we've heard it a number of times during this campaign, but on stage right now, we have a sitting lieutenant governor, uh, a sitting United States senator, a former state attorney general, and two people who have held the highest job in state government for attracting new businesses and jobs. With that said, and Ms. Crouch, we'll start with you here. How can anyone in this primary claim to be an outsider? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm proud of my public service. And I am the only one that has the political courage to take on axing the tax, to being, making priority those Hoosiers that struggle with mental illness and addiction as part of my campaign and part of my administration as governor. And as governor, I also have, a lieutenant governor, I have a track record. I led the fight to expand broadband throughout Indiana. I protected our farmland and our military sites. I stood up and fought FSSA on behalf of parents of severely disabled children. And then I voted for the largest property tax cut in our state's history and co-founded the Indiana Mental Re Health Roundtable to be able to bring help to those Hoosiers that are struggling with mental illness and addiction. I want to be a voice for you, the listeners, the viewers out there. I want to be the person that stands up for you to fight to eliminate the income tax, to fight the drug cartels and their Chinese allies, and then to be sure to help those that struggle with mental illness and addiction. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Doden, the, the claim of an outsider, how do you define it? Well, I, I'm not really focused on being an outsider. I mean, I'm focused on leadership and a bold vision, and that's what we've been pitching from day one. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity and the privilege to serve the state of Indiana, and during that time was the architect of regional cities. The first time in our history that we had put money into the regions, allowing each three regions to really uh, work with each other and grow. And we put uh, 126 million into the regions, and, and the private sector did $1.25 billion of deals in one year. Now we're trying to do something that's never been done in history. We're, we have a plan for our small towns for 50 years. We have ignored our small towns and forgotten them, and we have a plan to put 10% of our economic development budget into our small towns and, allow, and transform them all over the state of Indiana. We've gone further and said we're the first candidate in the country to come up with a zero-cost adoption plan that would help the 13,000 kids in foster care experience a loving home. This kind of vision and leadership is what we're focused on. So just to be clear, Mr. Doden, you don't consider yourself an outsider? I, I'm focused on being a leader and a visionary. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Braun, 60 seconds to you. So I think an outsider ought to be defined by what you've done for most of your life. Uh, I bucked the trend from the day I got out of school and moved back to my hometown. I've been a scrappy entrepreneur for 37 years. I've been the loudest voice in the U.S. Senate about fiscal integrity. So you can do it in many different ways. And it's going to boil down to who is really going to shake the system up. And I think that should be clear by what you've done methodically over a long period of time. And I cut my teeth in the real world. And the time I've spent in government, it's been railing against it. And the ultimate outsider in politics, you know who I'm talking about, endorse me, not anyone else on this stage. He is the guy that broke the system at the federal level, and now the system's trying to take him out. So if you want to know who the outsider is, that's very clear, and I represent that here. So just to be clear, just to be clear, you're talking about the former President Donald Trump? To be clear, yes. Okay, Mr. Braun, thank you very much. Mr. Hill, 60 seconds. Well, certainly the Indianapolis establishment has wanted me to be the outsider for my, my entire career, uh, but uh, they're going to have to work a little harder at that. Um, this, this is actually quite interesting because what I've coined is a new phrase, the inside outsider. Because that's what we have, these folks who claim to be outsiders, but they're deep, so deeply rooted. Uh, when you're talking about uh, the uh, Secretary of Commerce, uh, is, there a, is there a higher job, more influential job, uh, more inside job? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Mike Braun says he's an outsider because he worked for 37 years. Uh, no, you're not, Mike. You've, you've been in the system long enough. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make you an outsider. You know, he's in the Senate. Does it make him an outsider to have a, a, a global warming committee that has uh, Lisa Murkowski and, and uh, uh, Sue Collins, uh, the two most liberal Republicans uh, on that committee, uh, in, the, in the United States Senate, on his committee? Okay. 
Is that an outsider? I don't think so. Mr. Hill, thank you. Mr. Brown, I'll let you respond to that in a moment. I'll let you respond. Mr. Chambers, 60 seconds, though, on that. It's a simple definition. Who's been on the ballot the most? I've never been on a ballot until 30 days ago. Mr. Braun has been on the ballot at least five times, okay? Everybody else has been on a ballot multiple times. Listen, I respect public service. My point of view is that, it, that someone needs to be the CEO of a state and coming from outside in, like Mitch Daniels in 2005, has clear view. When you're in the system and you have multiple times that you're on the ballot, you're not an outsider. You're just not, Mike. I'm sorry. Listen, I, 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 I was asked to serve by, by Governor Holcomb. I, I agreed to two years for a dollar a year and broke every record in state history in economic development. That's called service. We built a great team. We brought $51 billion to every corner of the state, and we touched 92 counties with community investments through the Ready Program. 92, not just three. Not just three, Eric. 92 counties. We've already done what you're talking about. That's called service. That's called being an outsider. Okay. Mr. Chambers, thank you very much. I'll get to you in a second. Uh, Mr. Doden, Mr. Braun, your name was invoked. 30 seconds. So first of all, Curtis has never signed the front side of a paycheck. He may have run a lemonade stand years ago, Ooh. but he's been in government. He can Ooh. tell me what he's done. I can tell you, if you haven't done that, you have no reason to want to run the biggest business in our state, which is our state government. And when it comes to what two people involved in economic development have done, one has got the LEAP project as his crowning piece of uh, jewel. And this guy had ethics violations when he did run the economic uh, development uh, department. So you got to have a little uh, uh, experience or you get into pickles like that. Mr. Jordan, go ahead. 30 seconds. Well, first of all, I don't know why we're arguing about outsider. I think what voters are going to look at is who has a plan you know, what kind of leader do they want? And, you know, does their plan resonate with them? Do, do they want a plan for small towns? Do they want a plan for zero cost adoption? Do they want a plan for all 92 counties in every community? But I, I want to address, you know, this issue. Like, some of the things that you're saying about me, Senator Brown, are just not true. Uh, there's third party, independent third parties that have verified it's not true. I think that you know in your heart it's not true. And if you're a great leader, you'll take this and stop saying these things that are not true. Queen Jour Journal Gazette, uh, look, Eric, uh, your hometown. You know, I, I would appreciate it if you'd let me finish. finish up, yep. You know, great leaders have character, and they don't tell people things that are not true. All right. Um, we will, yes, you know, we, well, this is, this is why you Mr. cannot trust Mike Brown, 30, because he I is only bringing 30 seconds on that, Washington, D.C. politics right here to Indiana. Okay. Well, I'll get back to you in a second, Mr. Brown. Mr. Hill, you had your hand up. 30 yes, seconds sir. to you, sir. Go ahead. I did not run a lemonade stand. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I have is executive leadership experience. I ran the Attorney General's office, an office that had uh, nearly 400 people. Uh, Mike has been a legislator. Mike has been a legislator in the State House. He's been a legislator in the uh, United States Senate. That is different than governmental executive leadership. Running the government requires you to be able to make executive decisions on a regular basis. We don't have that in Mike Braun. Mr. Chambers, go ahead. Yeah. 30 seconds, yep. Sure. Senator, Senator Braun re referenced a, a pickle, in that, and that's called the Leap Innovation District in Boone County. That, that's called bold thinking. That's called long-term thinking that most politicians don't do, and that's why being uh, an outsider is important, because they'll do three-year decisions, not 10, 15-year decisions. That's a long-term decision for Indiana being ready. And because we were ready, we landed Eli Lilly's largest investment in its corporate history. And, and being in a pickle is a thousand new employees making over $100,000, and I was in a pickle. I will agree to that pickle, that it's gonna generate tens of billions of dollars of new economic impact in thousands of high wage jobs. That's good for Indiana. We're now ready okay. to compete in the global economy. Only 30 seconds for you, Ms. Krause. Go ahead, 30 seconds. Just for the record, I sign the front of 20,000 paychecks every other week as Auditor of State and as Auditor of State. Indiana's transparency portal was rated one of the best in the country because we focus on making government spending transparent and accountable, recognizing that every dollar that comes to government has a name and a face attached to it. Okay. Candidates, thank you very much. We could probably spend the rest of the night talking about this, but we have to move on. We'll have more questions coming up after the break. We're going to take a quick one. More coverage coming up in moments. You're watching the debate in the Republican primary for Indiana governor, live from Madam Walker Legacy Center in downtown Indianapolis. We will be right back.
Wish TV's GOP Governor's Debate is brought to you in part by Indianapolis Urban League and African American Coalition of Indianapolis. Wish TV's GOP Governor's Debate is brought to you in part by Gaylor Electric. And we are live, back live from the Madam Walker Legacy Center in downtown Indianapolis. You are watching the debate in the Republican primary for governor. Thank you for joining us tonight. Abortion has been one of the biggest political issues over the past two years with Indiana at the forefront. Garrett Berquist takes us through the history. Indiana was the first state to pass a new abortion ban after the United States Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. The only exceptions to Indiana's abortion ban are up to 10 weeks in the case of rape or incest and up to 20 weeks or fetal viability in cases of fatal fetal anomalies or to save the mother's life or prevent serious health complications. While lawmakers debated the bill, News 8 talked to two women who had had abortions. If I would not have been able to have that kind of medicine at that time, I mean, I would have died. I know it's wrong. God, is, God gave us all a choice, you know, here. Even though we have a choice, that doesn't mean it's right. It's worth noting a few months after Indiana lawmakers approved our state's abortion ban, Michigan voters approved a measure that explicitly enshrined the right to an abortion into their state's constitution. Phil and April. Okay, Garrett, thank you very much. And our question is this, and we'll start with you, Mr. Doden. Do you believe Indiana should consider a complete ban on abortion with no exceptions? And should Indiana pass a law guaranteeing access to in vitro fertilization? 60 seconds to you, sir. Start us off. Well, I, I've been clear. I'm ardently pro-life. I think it's a human rights issue, uh, not just a religious issue for me. And I'm also going to work with the General Assembly to protect in vitro fertilization. Uh, I think IVF, I think we want to promote people having children. We want to pr promote strong families. That's why we're the first candidate in the country to have a zero cost adoption policy that will allow kids that are born, but also our 13,000 kids in foster care uh, to be a part of a loving uh, family. And this adoption fund will not only help pay for adoption, but it will help pay for some of the very expensive aftercares that happen with families when they adopt uh, a child and there's just these expenses that can cause them financial difficulty. So we're gonna focus on, under my leadership as governor, uh, being not just pro-life, but pro-mother, pro-child, and pro-family, and that's how we're gonna lead. Mr. Braun, 60 seconds to you. I believe in the sanctity of life. I've uh, been there. I've got the highest ratings from all of the groups across the country here in our state as well. I think our state government got it right. They put something out there that was practical. Don't think nothing needs to change from where it is. If a case is ever raised to do something otherwise, the legislature can respond to it. IVF, there's no need to protect it because no one's trying to take it away. Everyone believes in that. There was one case in another state where that got corrected pretty quickly. And again, we should do more, if you believe in the sanctity of life, of helping a mother when she is in a troubled pregnancy to make sure to get through it, do more there. And then once the child is born, help nurture life there too. And that'll be something we probably need to do better at. Mr. Braun, thank you very much. Mr. Hill, do you believe Indiana should consider a complete ban on abortion? 60 seconds, sir. I believe in a culture of life, and a culture of life includes banning abortion. Uh, I personally believe that abortion should be under no circumstances, um, but I'm certainly understanding and willing to, t to tolerate the exceptions that are in place under the law. Uh, it's important that we understand that no one on this stage has, has come out and on terminated uh, pregnancy reports. Uh, recently, the Indiana Health Department determined that uh, they weren't going to provide terminated re uh, pregnancy reports to watchdog agencies. That's the way that we enforce to make sure that the ban is in place. I've come out to make sure that that's the case. And as governor, I will make sure that the health department uh, continues to put those terminated re uh, pregnancy reports in place. Um, we couldn't even get it done through legislation. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering why our lieutenant governor hasn't stepped in uh, to make sure that the health department has taken that step, that lead role in making sure that we can enforce abortion. Mr. Chambers, 60 seconds. 
Yes, I'm, I'm pro-life. I believe the exceptions are important. In, in Indiana spoke, legislature spoke in 22. That's settled law. I would not plan on revisiting that. As it relates to IVF, IVF, that's protected in state law as well. I think that's incredibly important. You know, the greatest joy of my life has been my son, and I think we need to promote families. Uh, and, and so through IVF, we can, we can do that. So I do support IVF as well. Now, you know, Eric uh, has, it talks about adoption a lot. He's passionate about it, and I, I think that's terrific. We need to grow families through all means, whether that's IVF or, or, or adoption as well. Okay, thank you. Ms. Crouch. My record is clear. I am pro-life. And as President of the Senate, I cast a tie-breaking vote to strengthen Indiana's abortion laws. Today, Indiana is one of the most pro-life states in the country. But it's also important that we support and wrap our arms around the, um, the moms and the children. And that is exactly what Indiana did by appropriating $45 million to support moms who are pregnant and their children. But when it comes to in vitro fertilization, as a woman and as a mom, I cannot imagine the anguish and the pain that those women and those couples go through that want to so desperately have a child and cannot. And so as governor, I will work with the General Assembly to ensure that we protect life, but also give those women the ability and those couples the ability to bring life into this world. Okay. Candidates, thank you very much. Thank you. April has the next question. Several viewer questions focused on small businesses right here in Indiana. What are your plans to help small businesses survive and succeed in this state? And what specific steps would you take to help minority-owned businesses? Mr. Braun, we're going to start with you. So the first thing I did uh, when I moved back to my hometown, I worked for a place for three years and immediately jumped into an opportunity of having your own small business. It was a scrappy navigation running a Main Street enterprise, nearly 20 years. Three of my four kids now run that business. That. Uh, turned into a larger company over time, the American dream. I'll know what to do there because I lived it. And one thing we can do is fertilize the field of smaller businesses in this state, help them become the next uh, regional and national business. That'll be a strong part of what I urge our economic development folks to do, is quit picking a few big companies to help them, start focusing on helping all of the little fledgling companies that many of them can turn into that company that grows jobs, brings kids back to their uh, own counties, and a place to live. That's what I'll do. Thank you, Mr. Braun. Mr. Hill, how would you help small and minority businesses? The best thing that we can do for any business is to decrease our regulatory controls, uh, allow the free market to, to uh, work and do its thing. Uh, there are winners and losers, and we don't need the state of Indiana picking either. Uh, we need to make sure that we cooperate, that we provide guidance and assurance, uh, information on how to start a business, on what resources are available. Um, our state has that information, and we need to make sure that we get that out to, to all corners and all sectors of our community. But first and foremost, we have to recognize that we are a free enterprise system, that uh, there are winners, there are losers, and they make it on their own. Uh, we want to make sure that we give them the, the uh, resources uh, and information to, uh, to make that application, but we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to succeed. All right, thank you. Mr. Chambers? Yeah, I started mowing lawns in, as a teenager with some of the folks in this room, turned that into a national real estate business over 40 years. I am a Hoosier entrepreneur. I started from zero and built a national business. It is, it is a passion of mine to, to grow our entrepreneurial ecosystem. The first thing I would do on day one is, is uh, put a secretary of entrepreneurship in place. When I became secretary of commerce, there was one person talking about entrepreneurship in the state. The, the, the most uh, well-known entrepreneur in our state was 170 years ago, and his name's Eli Lilly. It's the largest pharma company in the world right now. We need to do more in Indiana. We've got talent. We've got great universities. We've got great people. We need to grow our entrepreneurial ecosystem, and I would do that as an entrepreneur governor. Um, the, the, uh, the, the other thing is big businesses that I get criticized for, bringing those in, those spurn hundreds of small and medium-sized businesses and support small and medium-sized businesses like in Kokomo and New Carlisle, all over the state. So grow the economy, and, and, and especially so through entrepreneurship. Ms. Crouch. I am the only candidate on the stage who has the political courage to eliminate the state income tax and axe the tax. Do you realize that today it costs $11,000 more 
than it did three years ago just to meet basic household needs. And to the average Hoosier, we can put $2,000 back into your pockets every year. That not only helps Hoosiers that are struggling today with the high cost of living inflation and binomics, but it helps our small businesses grow and prosper. The National Federation of Independent Businesses said the best thing we can do to help small business in Indiana is eliminate the state income tax. So when we eliminate the tax, not only do we give you your money back, but we also help our small businesses grow and flourish. And then we're able to make Indiana a no income tax state, attracting people to Indiana because today they're going to Tennessee, Texas, Florida, and South Dakota, which are no income tax states. Let's help small businesses. Let's help Hoosiers. Ax the tax. Thank you, Ms. Crouch. Mr. Doden, what plans would you have to help small and minority businesses? Well, this is where I get very excited, and here's the win-win. Uh, when you look at our Indiana Main Street initiative, for 50 years, we've ignored our small towns all over the state of Indiana. And we have two and a half million people that live in them. And so here's, here's what happens when you begin to restore communities top to bottom. It solves a housing crisis. One of the things you have to do to grow small businesses is attract and retain talent. They have to have a place to live. So it solves a housing crisis. It also increases community pride, which also increases the spirit of entrepreneurship. And then it also is a small business growth model. What we've seen is you, you fix and restore these buildings as people begin to come in and start small businesses. And what we know, all of us who have run businesses, and I've started businesses, we often started you know, at an entry level business where we started running it, and then we continue to grow in our business over time into larger businesses. Uh, this is how we create an environment and an ecosystem where people can be successful in small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Doe. I'm gonna send it back to you, Phil. Okay, we're running short on time, so I wanna keep your, your answers on this one to about 30 seconds, okay? This was a, a frequent question that we got on our Facebook page and also via email. Do you believe Indiana should stop observing daylight saving time? It's a big question. A lot of people wanna know. Mr. Hill. Um, I, I, liked it. I liked the system that we had before Mitch came in and meddled with it. Um, I think now we're at a point where I don't know that it matters that much. I think, uh, I think the thing that matters most to me is that we gotta have Indiana on one time. Uh, we're evenly split, it can be Eastern or Central. I would choose Eastern time uh, to uh, go along with the markets. Um, but uh, uh, I think that would be our priority. Okay, Mr. Hall, thank you. Mr. Chambers, 30 I've, seconds. I've heard the same thing as I've traveled the state. I, you know, I, you, you just have to sit down and talk to small, small and medium-sized businesses and all businesses, really. It really affects the ag community, and that's where I've heard it the most. And so I'd want to make sure that they're part of the, the conversation on, on whether we stick to one time and whether that's Central or Eastern. Ms. Crouch. Someone who lives in Indianapolis during the week and then travels to Evansville every weekend because that's where my home is, it's where my husband is, and don't feel sorry for him, he loves the arrangement. But I don't hear, I go from central to eastern time all the time. And when I'm out listening to Hoosiers and talking to them, I don't hear this central eastern time discussion as much as let's not move up and back and forth. And so I believe that perhaps that is an issue that the General Assembly may want to take up, but if I had to bet money, I bet they won't. Okay, all right. Ms. Crouch, thank you. Mr. Doden? Well, I've said, look, we're open to the discussion. Uh, there's obviously different people who have different thoughts on this, uh, but the General Assembly will have to decide whether they take this up and we'll have a, a discussion about it and see what they want to do. Do you have a position on it though? I, I, don't, ha I don't have a, a, a dog in the hunt. Uh, I'm just open to, to different ideas and seeing where the General Assembly wants to go with it. Fair enough. Mr. Braun. So I've been visiting all 92 counties for the five years I've been a senator, and that topic comes up all the time. And it's two different issues. We're technically in the central time zone. Uh, that zone would be way over on the east side of Indiana, if not in Ohio. But we always oriented towards east coast due to business. Business is moving to the south and southwest. That's a separate issue from springing forward and falling back. And yes, farmers in some places that actually work for a living, they need that daylight, daylight to get it done. Yeah. So I think you've got to be careful with that. It's probably a 50-50 issue. Okay, so what would you do? I would uh, be more apt to get rid of changing your clocks than I would be the time zone. Okay, all right. Candidates, thank you very much. Uh, we want to thank you for answering all of these questions tonight. We now turn to our closing statements tonight. Per our debate agreement, each candidate has up to 90 seconds for a closing statement. We held a draw before the debate, and the first closing statement goes to 
Mr. Hill. 90 seconds to you, sir. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm running for governor because Hoosiers are hungry for proven conservative leadership. And by proven, I mean, what have you done that demonstrates what you will do going forward? Uh, we have uh, a crossroads in our state and in our nation. Our government has failed us. Uh, many of the people who we sent to Washington have failed us and quit on us. It's imperative that we get this right. We have lost faith in our institutions. We've seen the, manip the manipulation of our justice system, the weaponization of race, and the sexualization of our children. And it's time to elect strong, bold leaders that will turn this around. I believe in a culture of life. That's why in 2019, or excuse me, in, in, uh, when 20, 2,411 Indiana boarded babies were found abandoned in a garage in Illinois, I brought them back and had them buried in Indiana soil to establish their humanity and death that was denied them in life. I believe in liberty. I believe in freedom, fighting for freedom. That's why I fought the governor and, and the, the Holcomb and Crouch administration um, on the mask mandate in 2019. I believe in truth. That's why when the BMV created a new, gener a, a new classification of individual, the, 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 th the third gender, I fought that because the truth of the matter is there are only two genders, male and female, and that's worth fighting for. This election is about leadership. It's about courage. It's about boldness. My name is Curtis Hill. I'm running for governor. Check me out at CurtisHill.com. Thank you so much. God bless you. Okay. Mr. Hill, thank you very much. Mr. Chambers, 90 seconds, closing statement. Yeah, thank you. Listen, I'm not a career politician. That's probably pretty evident here tonight. I, I've never dreamed of, of running for public office or especially in, uh, a governor's office. It took every ounce of faith and personal courage for me and my family and my wife to, to get to this decision. But I'm grateful for my journey from starting a company from nothing. I'm grateful for my journey, and I want to I pay that forward. As Secretary of Commerce, I saw what the, the missed opportunities are for a growing economy. I saw what having wages 30% lower than U.S. average or economic growth below U.S. average does to people. It's, it's, it's the difference between a working mom having two jobs. And so we can do better, but we've got to go get the future that's good for Hoosiers. We've got to go get the future that brings in more revenue so we can fix education and put our kids on a, on a trajectory for success in, in Indiana and to keep our kids and our college kids here. We've got to go grow the economy to fix education and support our police. And a growing economy, oh, by the way, has the benefit of being able to lower or shrink government because crime goes down. Healthcare improves. Welfare goes down. A growing economy lifts people up, shrinks government. And we can do better as Indiana. I'm running for governor because I believe Indiana is great, but that it can be even better. But we, we need an outside. We, we need someone with fresh eyes, a business person who's done this before, who signed the front of a paycheck for 40 years, who knows how to run things and shoot aspirational goals and build great teams. That's why I'm running for governor. And I'd ask for your, your support on this journey. Thank you. Mr. Chambers, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Crouch, 90 seconds, your final statement. To the undecided viewers out there, know that the battle for the heart and soul of America will not be won in Washington, D.C. with the endless bickering and inability to get things done. The battle for the heart and soul of America will be won state by state. I'm running for governor to make sure that Indiana doesn't become a California, New York, a Michigan, or an Illinois. I'm running for governor to protect our conservative values. As governor, I'll make sure parents control what's being taught to our children. We'll stand shoulder to shoulder with law enforcement and enforce our crime laws to the fullest. And we will send a message to the criminals and the fentanyl dealers that you may get into this country through our wide open southern borders, but when you come to Indiana, you will pay the price. We're going to ax the tax. We'll live within our means. And we're not going to saddle our children and grandchildren with a mountain of debt. As governor, I'll support our companies, our workers, so we can compete with other states and countries, including China, and win. The Indiana you and I will build will never cast aside our most vulnerable Hoosiers, the unborn, the elderly, the disabled, those struggling with mental illness and addiction, because they're our families, our friends, and our neighbors. Know the Indiana you and I will build together will never compromise in protecting faith, family, and freedom. I'm Suzanne Crouch. I'm running for governor. I ask for your vote on May 7th. Let's build a better Indiana together. Thank you. Ms. Crouch, thank you very much. Mr. Doden, your final statement, 90 seconds. 
Well, my grandpa was a pastor and a big influence in my life. And uh, he taught me that faith without works is dead and without vision, people perish. So what you can expect from me as your governor is a bold vision for the people of Indiana. We're the only one that has a plan for the 92 counties and all of our small towns where two and a half million people live so that our kids and grandkids can grow up in stronger communities. We have a plan to strengthen families with a zero cost adoption policy, the first one in the country, where our kids that are in foster care, 13,000, can live and experience a loving family. And then we have a plan to attract the best leaders possible to make sure that we manage the agency heads, that we restrain bureaucracy, and that we serve the people of Indiana with excellence. But today I'm gonna to ask you for something. I'm gonna ask you to roll up your sleeves and put your faith to work. We cannot do this alone. This is gonna be a team effort. No matter how talented we are, not one person alone is going to impact seven million people. It has to be a team. I'm also asking you to have a bold vision for your community and then expect us as state leaders to really be a partner with you in that vision. And then I'm gonna ask you to pray for us. Pray that we will have wisdom and that we will have a servant's heart. Thank you. Mr. Doty, thank you very much. Mr. Braun, your final statement. So I think when you're trying to determine who's gonna be our next governor here, I would really pay attention to what you've done up to this point. Uh, I'll take the record that I've had five years as your U.S. Senator, when you're determined to be one of the most, the most effective Senator that's come in in the last six years by two different organizations, you know how to get things done. When you're a successful business owner and you do it in a scrappy, hard scrabble way in your own hometown, look at that. The proudest thing, we didn't even talk about it this evening, it's probably the number two issue in our state, along with education, is the high cost of our health care. You know, we are beset with some of the poorest health care outcomes, and no one sticks their neck out on that because you're poking the biggest bear out there. I fixed it in my own business 16 years ago by making it, getting my employees involved in their own well-being, giving them the tools to do it, uh, taking transparency, uh, making it a tool to use, wellness, prevention, cut costs by over 50% then we've not had a premium increase since then. That's getting something done. So make your choice on who's gonna stick their neck out, who's gonna risk that political capital when you give them the opportunity. And I think I can make that case clearly that I've done it throughout my life. And it's proud to represent Hoosiers there. I can't wait to come back and do it here. Well, we want to thank each candidate for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much for being here tonight. And of course, you at home, thank you for watching as well. Thank you to our live audience here at the Madam Walker Legacy Center in downtown Indianapolis. A reminder for you that you still have time to register to vote in this year's primary. The registration deadline is Monday, April 8th. Early voting begins the next day. Election day is May 7th. From all of us here at Wish TV, have a great rest of your night. We'll see you back here tonight at 10 and 11, always online at wishtv.com. If you've missed any of our coverage tonight, head on over to our website. Much more tonight. Thank you for joining us.